Welcome to the Adult Bible Study with First Baptist Church of Grace City. My name is Charles. I'm one of our associate pastors, and today we're continuing our study in Luke chapter 6, verse 1 through 11, looking at Jesus interacting with some of the scribes and the Pharisees. I hope you enjoy today's Bible study. To truly understand today's passage, we must understand a critical thing, and that is what the Sabbath is is because the Sabbath is a major point of contention within the ministry of Jesus specifically in this passage that we're talking about today. So what is the Sabbath? Well, the Hebrew word that we translate as Sabbath means to cease. It is a reference to the seventh day of creation on which the Lord rested and has called his people to rest. Therefore, it was to be a day of rest spiritual refreshment with no labor. But why does so much controversy revolve around the Sabbath? The reason that so much controversy revolves around the Sabbath is because the Sabbath is a distinctive part of the Jewish faith. Everyone else at that time did not take days off. They worked straight through the Sabbath. But the Jews became distinctive from the rest of the cultures around them because of their observance of a Sabbath day, which we're told in Deuteronomy, they're not to work at all. But on the seventh day is a Sabbath day, a ceasing day, a day of resting to the Lord, your God. It's in observance of the Sabbath and for the honor and glory of God that they would do this. So they would cease working on the Sabbath. Do not do any work, you, your sons, your daughters, your male and female servants, your oxes and donkeys, any of your livestock or the resident aliens who live within your city gates. No one is to do work at all. It is to be a day of rest. Even your male and female servants so that they might rest as you do. It's to be a day of rest, to be a day of refreshment, spiritual nourishment. But by the time of first century AD, which is the time period of Jesus, religious leaders had developed a detailed and rigorous list of allowed and disallowed activities for the Sabbath day. So we come to our passage today. During this first century AD, when there is all of these allowed and disallowed activities, and on a Sabbath day, he being Jesus and his disciples passed through the grain fields. What kind of grain fields were they passing through? Well, presumably it's wheat based on the description that's given here because they picked the heads of grain, they rubbed them in their hands, and they ate them. Just points to the fact that it is wheat, but... Some of the Pharisees said, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? So one of the main questions that we have to ask ourselves about this, this section of what the Pharisees are saying is, what were they doing that was not lawful? And presumably based on the fact that they were picking or harvesting heads of grain and rubbing them together in their hands, they were doing work on the Sabbath. And what made this not lawful was that the rubbing of the grains in their hand was considered a form of threshing wheat. Also, they were harvesting it with their hands. And we understand this from the Mishnah, which is one of the earliest collections of rabbinic oral tradition set to writing, which forbids threshing on the Sabbath. So this is what the disciples are ultimately being accused of. And so Jesus responds to the Pharisees by explaining why his disciples' actions were proper and the Pharisees' rules were too restrictive. He answered them, Haven't you read what David and those who were with him did when he was hungry? What scripture is Jesus referencing here? He's referencing 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 1 through 6. And what was the context of this passage? David was fleeing Saul because Saul was trying to kill him. And he comes into the house of the Lord. He entered the house of the Lord, which that's understood based on context within that original verse. He asks for the the bread of presence and he takes it and he eats the bread of presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat. Now, would the Pharisees have been familiar with this section of Scripture? Absolutely. It is a part of the Hebrew Bible. In the original part, that's considered the former prophets, which talks through the history of the people of Israel, specifically of David. 
And why would Jesus use David here as his example? Because David was the quintessential or ideal Hebrew man. He was a man after God's own heart and the one in whom the Messiah, we now know as Jesus, would come through. And so David, this man after God's own heart, this man whom has been and will be promised that the Messiah would come through, he enters based on his authority into the house of God and takes the bread of presence, which is only lawful for the priest to eat, and he eats it. So based on our context, what is the meaning of this scriptural analogy? That human needs and circumstances permit an exception to the rigid application of the law. So why did Jesus use this passage of scripture? By Old Testament law, only the priests were the ones who were allowed to eat the bread of presence. Yet, how did Ahimelech, who's the priest that gives the bread of presence to David, how did he respond in light of David's circumstances where he is hungry and he is in need? He gives him, David took from Ahimelech the bread of presence, to be able to eat. So Ahimelech, the priest, understands the need and understands that the law is not to be held so rigidly because it is for our good that God gives to us. It's also understood of who David is. As the one in whom the Messiah would come, the man after God's own heart, the prophesied king of Israel, his authority allows him to be able to take this and eat this bread of presence. Then we come to how Jesus is applying this. And he told them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. What does this title, the Son of Man, imply? It can be a reference to his humanity since he is fully man and fully God. Or it's a declaration of his Messiahship, the one in whose kingdom will have no end. His dominion, an everlasting dominion that will not pass away based on Daniel 7, 13, and 14, in which one like a son of man was coming with the clouds of heaven. Also, based on the audience that Luke is writing to, he would have been writing to a Christian audience. And this understanding of the son of man title would have been readily applied to Jesus. And so we can understand this as being a title of Jesus's messiahship, his, the fact that he is the Christ. But what does it mean that the son of man is the Lord of the Sabbath? Well, that title, Lord of the Sabbath, is not a title that is used, a stock title that is used on a regular basis. But it would have specifically referred to Yahweh of the Old Testament and who set up the Sabbath and in whose honor it was observed. So what should we see in Jesus saying that the Son of Man himself would use this title, is the Lord of the Sabbath? It's that he is progressively revealed as the Lord in his teaching and action from the healing of the paralyzed man and now in relation to the most sacred and divine institution, the Sabbath. Jesus is the one supreme authority. He is Lord of the Sabbath. He is God, the Son of Man. But this controversy over the Sabbath doesn't just end here. It goes on to our next verses, verses 6 and 7, on another Sabbath. What does this tell us of the event in the field and this event? Well, one, the event in the field takes place first, and this is the second event on another Sabbath. At some later time, he enters the synagogue this time rather than a field and was teaching. What was Jesus teaching on? We're not told what Jesus is teaching on. We're just told that he was teaching because that's not the purpose for Luke in writing this section. Unlike in chapter 4 where Jesus is teaching from the book of Isaiah and telling of who he is, Jesus' teaching was not the focus. This account focuses on his interaction with a man whose right hand was shriveled and his interaction with the scribes and the Pharisees. But in particular, this man. And what do we know about this man? He was a man whose right hand was shriveled. For his right hand to be shriveled, it means that it was probably paralyzed and had withered or atrophied, shriveled, based on disuse. And this shriveling of his hand would have affected his daily life. He would have been unable to work effectively. He would have been looked down on by the larger society because of his inability to be an effective Jew because of this 
injury or birth defect of his hand. And we have no indication of how this happened. All that is clear is that the man has a need because he needs healing in some way because his right hand is shriveled, unable to be used. The word here in the Greek literally just means to be dried up. And the scribes and the Pharisees were watching him closely. Are these the same scribes and Pharisees that we see back in verse 2? Some of the Pharisees? It doesn't really tell us. We do know that they had to have been of some of the same groups as the previous because of the way that they're watching Jesus. And we know that they're watching Jesus extremely closely, obviously, because it tells us that. And basically, this just means that they are staying near him and keeping watch over his actions. They want to see everything that Jesus does because they're trying to find a way to charge something against him, to discredit him, to potentially excommunicate him, or as we see in other sections of Scripture, to execute him altogether. They are doing everything they can to find a charge against Jesus. But we need to see something really particular, and that is what the Pharisees know about Jesus. Because they're looking to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. They're looking for two things here. One, would he heal and would it be on the Sabbath? They obviously already have a knowledge of the fact that Jesus has the power to heal and a knowledge that he is willing to break their Sabbath traditions regarding certain prohibited actions. This should show us something particular about the Pharisees. And the question that we must ask ourselves is, what does this show us about the devotion of the Pharisees? It shows us they are more devoted to their Sabbath traditions than anything else. They were so devoted to their traditions that instead of doubting their traditions because of the power of God being revealed before them based on the healings that Jesus was able to do, they instead held to their traditions so tightly they rejected the source and goodness of Jesus' healings and sought to condemn and excommunicate Him by finding a charge that they could bring against him. Jesus knows that this is exactly what they're going to be doing. He knew their thoughts. It's also something that we should take note of, that Luke puts this in here again, similar to what he did previously when Jesus is interacting with the Pharisees. He knew their thoughts. He knows the thoughts of man. It tells us also, very telling, of what the coming actions are going to be. Jesus' coming actions, because he knows their thoughts, were meant to reveal the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and scribes. So does Jesus understand the implications of his actions? Absolutely. He knew they were attempting to charge him and bring charges against him. And he knows that what he's about to do will incite rage within the Pharisees and the scribes. And so he tells this man, he told the man, this man who has the withered hand, get up, and stand here. Where is this man standing? He's standing next to Jesus. And we know in verse 6 that Jesus was teaching, which means that he is in the place of prominence within the synagogue. And so he is drawing this man with the shriveled hand into the place of prominence. Why would Jesus have this man stand in a place of prominence? Because he wanted everyone to see what he was about to do. So he, the man with the shriveled hand, got up and stood there. Jesus' intent was to make it a clear and observable to all who were present. And then Jesus said to them, I ask you, in typical rabbi style, he asks them a question to draw out an implication. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil? What is the implicit answer to this first question? Well, of course, It's to do good on the Sabbath, not to do evil. Because to do evil would have been the antithesis of God's law. And then the second question, tying with the first, is it lawful to save life or to destroy it? Well, again, the answer is to save life rather than to destroy it because to save a life is, again, the obvious answer because to destroy life is the antithesis of God's law. Something else that we must take into consideration is what is the difference between Jesus' teaching here in verse 9 versus his teaching here in 3 through 4. Because in 3 through 4, 
Jesus answered using scripture from 1 Samuel 21, 1 through 6. But here, Jesus is teaching based on the nature of God's Sabbath law. Mark 2.27 tells us that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. What was the message Jesus was trying to get across? The absence of doing good on the Sabbath when it is known to be needed is evil by default. To do nothing when you know that good is needed to be done is evil. It destroys. And after he says this, he looks around at all of them. Who is Jesus's message for? All the worshipers that were present, not only the scribes and the Pharisees, but anyone and everyone who was there listening to Jesus' teaching that day, as well as today because of the transmission of God's word to us. Who is Jesus' message for? Everyone. That it is better to do good on the Sabbath than to do evil. To just sit and do nothing is evil when you know that there is good that needs to be done. So how did Jesus use his Sabbath? Well, he tells this man, stretch out your hand. And that man did this and his hand was restored. Jesus restores the hand of this man who had a crippled hand. He does good seeing a need on the Sabbath. What was demonstrated by this act? Everyone who was there, when he looked around at all of them, everyone, all of them, would have seen the power of God demonstrated for good, validating Jesus' divine authority and revealing the misapplication of God's command by the religious leaders. This filled the religious leaders with rage. What does this reveal, expose about those religious leaders? It reveals and shows the attitude that they had towards Jesus. Because even though Jesus does good and he restores this man's hand, they go into a fit of rage. <laughs> what was it that incited this rage? Jesus spoke truth and challenged their religious traditions. And from there, these religious leaders started to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus, which we know will ultimately lead to the death of Jesus Christ. Because he spoke truth, he challenged religious traditions, and he pointed out the sin in our lives and in their lives. Let us prioritize meeting people's needs over keeping ritual religious traditions. Welcome to the question and answer time. My name is Summer, I'm Pastor Charles's wife, and we're glad you're here with us. Um, today was such a good study for me. I just loved it because I've tried to dig into this section of scripture a few times. Um, when the Lord talks about the Sabbath, I just know I don't cease from working well. And so I really lean in a lot of times when mm -hmm. the Sabbath is talked about. And so I've done a lot of research in First Samuel tying in with this verse. But all along, it was just really funny for me listening to the Bible study, knowing like, wow, I'm just like the Pharisees and scribes. Like, I've missed the heart of what Jesus is trying to teach here. He was trying to teach a ton of things. He was teaching them he was God. Mm -hmm. He was teaching them that even though they're keepers of the law, even writers of the law, they've missed the heart of oh, the law. Yeah. Um, and how often we do that. But one thing that I really wanted to walk away from this with is um, the Lord is just teaching me my understanding of his word has to be applied. Mm -hmm. So applied theology, what I have learned has to change my life. It has to influence my life. It has to be how I live my life. Yeah. And so one question I want to talk about is basically how or what are your thoughts about how our human traditions, our opinions, how do we essentially get in the way of what God is trying to do just because we might have an opinion of how church might need to look for our comfortable um, experience or how a Bible study might need to happen because that's just how great, great grandpa did Bible study. How, mm -hmm. how do you think we can kind of break out of this tradition mold um, and allow the Bible to speak into our lives rather than kind of being stuck in what we expect, but it doesn't mean that it's in God's word. That mm -hmm. even affects how we study the Bible and apply it. So what are your thoughts on applying theology rather than in kind of breaking our tradition that gets in the way sometimes? I think a lot of it starts with a repentant heart. 
knowing that there is only one true, perfectly righteous, perfectly pure individual, which means that we all come with our own biases. We all come with our own way in which we see or understand or think that everything is supposed to be, whether that's the music, whether that's the Bible study, whether that's the way that the Word of God is broken down. Um, we all come with our own way of approaching things because of our own history, our own past. Um, but we have to come to Scripture understanding and knowing that we are sinful. And because we are sinful, we must understand that we don't have it perfect. And that our way of approaching the Bible is not perfect. And that's exactly what we have here with Jesus is the scribes, they have done a really good job of making sure that they are doing exactly what they've kind of created um, with their rabbinic teachings. They're doing a really good job of that. The problem is because they focus so hard on that, they've gotten away from the heart behind the whole scripture to begin with. Yeah, scripture's perfect, <clears throat> but we're not. That's right. And so that would be my, I mean, we have to be teachable, and we have to be willing to say that we're wrong. And a lot of you want to know the biggest thing that I think that gets in the way of that is being is seeing that we are wrong. Mm -hmm. A lot we of don't us want don't that. want to hear that we're wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's the biggest thing is being able to look at this, being able to hear the words of Jesus and go, I've been wrong, mm -hmm. and I need to change in this way. Just like the Pharisees did not do mm -hmm. here, where Jesus basically point blank says you're wrong and what is their reaction they already had a preconceived notion of who jesus was and what they were going to do with jesus before they ever even really heard mm -hmm. they jesus had speak agenda. they had an agenda they came in and said i'm going to push what i want rather than saying okay jesus you are who you are mm -hmm. how do i how do i conform my life to the word of god in the way that you are saying the word of god and in, in, in your understanding as God, as God's son, mm -hmm. the way that you understand the Bible to be. I think that even that's why maybe like Nicodemus is highlighted in John is because out of the Pharisees, you see he was teachable. Mm -hmm. um, and a small little nugget that the Lord showed to me in the Bible study that I had never picked up on, Jesus is essentially getting to um, what James... Do I have it open? Yep. James uh, 4, verse 17 says, Whoever knows the right thing to do it and fails to do it for him, it is sin. And mm -hmm. who is James? Historically, they think this is Jesus' brother. Yeah. And so it's like, I wonder if, if James was there that day or if, if Jesus taught the same thing in a different instance and he was there and he was learning. Yeah. So I thought that was kind of cool that even Jesus might have, been teaching his brother potentially and he applied that to his writings yeah i want to encourage you who are watching today if you were if you're wrestling with pride um i know that's something that i personally wrestle with and it can get in the way of really understanding what scripture is telling us and really being able to apply scripture to our lives and so i want to encourage you i want to challenge you um allow the word of god to speak and allow, and allow yourself to actually hear what the Word of God says, not what you want the Word of God to say. That's my challenge for us today as we look at this passage of Scripture and as we really challenge ourselves. Are we doing good the way that the Bible calls us to do good? Or are we just doing good based on the way that we want good to be? That's my challenge. We enjoy the Bible study, and we look forward to doing this again with you next week.